So hello and welcome everyone. Uh, we're here tonight to talk about public art at the DeWitt Playground. My name is Sarah Rodrigo and I'm the public art project manager for the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture. On this slide, you'll see some recent examples of public art commissions and projects involving the existing collection. You can see that there's quite a variety and we're excited to continue to expand the city's collection by working with innovative artists on new and exciting projects like the one you're about to hear about. I'm gonna give a quick background on our process and then hand this over to the play team. Uh, just a little housekeeping first. Please note that this meeting is being recorded. We also ask that everyone work together to make this a fun and welcoming meeting. That means staying muted during the presentations and sharing the floor with other attendees. If you have questions or comments, please use the chat or when appropriate, raise your hand, which is that little feature we've all learned a lot about in the last year. So public art and capital projects. The artwork for the DeWitt Playground is what we call a city commissioned project, meaning the city of Boston through the mayor's office of arts and culture and in collaboration with other city departments has commissioned an artist or artist team to create a new long-term artwork for city property. The artwork for the DeWitt Playground at Madison Park High School Athletic Complex is funded through our Percent for Art program, which integrates art into capital projects. 1% of the city's annual borrowing budget is set aside to commission new long-term public art projects all over the city to complement capital construction projects like the Parks Department's renovation of the DeWitt Playground. Public art relies upon community members, especially artists. Here are a few of the artists we're currently working with, and there may be some familiar faces in there. You may wonder, how do we find artists to commission? Once the Office of Arts and Culture in collaboration, in this case, with the Parks Department, Boston Public Schools, the Department of Public Works, the Department of Neighborhood Development, and many, many community partners, determined that the DeWitt Playground was a good site for public art, we released a call to artists. In response, we received dozens of proposals and portfolios from artists around the country and even a few international artists. An artist review committee comprised of local arts professionals, commissioners from the BAC, which is the Boston Art Commission, and design professionals reviewed the artist portfolios, interviewed three finalists, and ultimately recommended the play team to the Boston Art Commission for the project. In addition to community meetings like tonight, the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture holds public meetings with the Boston Art Commission to discuss and review public art projects from across the city. Each public artwork we commission is presented a few times at these public meetings, including ones for artist selection, ones for preliminary design review, and then again for final design. These meetings are open to the public and are now recorded and the agendas and slides are available to the public. You can find all this information on boston.gov slash public art. The BAC is an independent board of volunteers that approves and commissions innovative and transformative public artworks around the city. The BAC holds public meetings every second Tuesday of the month to vote on public art projects in Boston. And the public is welcome to attend, um, share their thoughts and ask questions. You can see a lovely screenshot of one of our meetings from early in the pandemic before my hair came back. The BAC unanimously approved the play team for the DeWitt Playground Commission at one of their public meetings. Once the play team meets, we're looking forward to their presenting a preliminary design to the BAC in the near future. And that brings us to tonight. It is my very great pleasure to introduce the play team, which is artist Marlon Forrester and Studio Luz Architects. Tonight, co-founder and principal Hansi Better Barada is here, as well as project manager and designer Jason Jang. Welcome, Marlon, Hansi, and Jason. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And um, so, thank you, Sarah, for that amazing introduction, uh, and, and 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 also highlighting, you know, how the city is, you know, really working to create a space for the public, and also to not only think about that space as a space of transformation but also a space that artists can activate. Uh, my name is Marlon Forster. Uh, I am the lead artist or, an, well, an artist working in collaboration with Studio Luz Architects uh, to design the DeWeep Playground uh, place, um, 
Hansi? Thank you so much, Marlon. Yes, I'm Hansi Beta Barraza. I'm an architect here in Roslindale. I've been in practice for 20 years, and it brings me great joy to be working on this public art project with Marlon. And also we have, uh, in, in the back, we have super talented uh, assistant and artist, uh, a, a designer, uh, Jason. Jason? Hello, uh, my name is Jason. Um, I'm one of the um, project designers slash manager at Studio, from Studio Luz. I'm really excited to be part of this uh, program, uh, project, sorry, <laughs> and working with Marlon. Um, yeah, super excited. Thank you, everyone. And, and also excellent, last but not least, uh, Kathy, if you wanna say uh, a little bit about. Sure, I'm Kathy Baker Eclipse. I'm with uh, Boston Parks and Recreation and uh, the, the DeWitt Playground at the corner of DeWitt Road, DeWitt Road and uh, Ruggles Street was my was a project that I was a project manager for. Um, so we, we had uh, anticipated that there would be some art coming in afterwards and we're really excited to see this come to fruition. Okay, so, so thank you, Kathy, for all your team work and support. Um, and so what we'll do very quickly is we'll start with a video uh, that kind of expresses, you know, the, uh, not only the idea of intergenerational, intergenerational uh, you know, movements around the actual public space, but we'll look at how we as play think about community and education and transformation through this amazing project. So Jason, if you could share the video, please, uh, we'll, we'll start with that. You could uh, turn up the volume just a little bit louder, please. So, so thank you so much for sharing the video, Jason. And uh, uh, can we uh, begin with the first slide? And so initially, uh, just uh, as we look at the, the space here, um, my work uh, deals primarily with and has explored the idea of the black male body in sports and, and primarily looking at basketball as a space for transformation and ritual. Uh, and so having the opportunity to work uh, in transforming a physical space uh, has been a dream of mine. And so this court itself is for me a space in which I, as a young person, had an opportunity to actually play on. Uh, I was part of uh, what's called Boston Neighborhood. Uh, it's called BNBL, which is Boston Neighborhood Basketball League. And so as a young person growing up in Boston, um, I was able to play here. Uh, I think it was uh, the finals from Boston for the uh, BNBL League. And so I had an opportunity to play here and compete. And so this is an absolute joy uh, as an artist to be able to come back years later and, and help to envision uh, what the future uh, could look like, but also activate this space for communities who live within the area. Um, so can we move on to the next slide? Uh, so here are some of the themes, our project vision, right? The idea of history was very important for us. Discovery, exploration, uh, play, health and wellness, uh, interactivity, uh, intergenerational engagement and environment. These were some key concepts in our, in our vision um, that we were trying to, uh, to think about and reflect on uh, as we were designing the space. Next. Neighborhood. Uh, located behind Madison Park, 
uh, the uh, behind the Masson Park Athletic Complex. The Reggie Lewis is close to it, but this site was and still remains a very active space in terms of engagement. Hansi, can you talk a little bit about uh, the, the location of the space and, and how yeah. you see it as an architect? I mean, I think that when we're doing these maps, uh, it was important to um, kind of place cultural, cultural spaces that were really important, important to the Black community and how the public art can begin to represent some of those memories of places. Uh, and specifically historical figures that have come through Boston, how can we um, you know, create an, an, uh, a public kind of engagement that makes all of these connections between the past and the present? Excellent, thank you. Uh, next. And so uh, the site itself was uh, designed by uh, you know uh, aspects of the city, so they came in and, and they worked to create some. Uh, as you see, there's play structures, there's a fitness area, um, and there's uh, some other smaller play areas um, already incorporated into the space. So those were things that uh, within the overall design that we are um, not interacting with, but are in the functional space uh, in terms of use. Next. Uh, here are some of our partners. Uh, so in terms of community members and outreach, uh, we've reached out to the Madison Park Development Corporation. We've also reached out to Dudley Square Neighborhood Initiative, uh, Roxbury Main Street, St. Catherine Drexel Parish Center, Yaki Club of Roxbury, St. John's and St. James Church in Roxbury, the Unitarian Universalist Urban Ministry, as well as Roxbury Cultural District, and of course, the Black Market Nubia and also Richard Taylor. So we have done uh, work, uh, and recently we had, uh, if you can speak about it, I think in the next image, uh, a opportunity to really engage the, the community on the ground. Hansi? Yeah, so um, it was important in terms of community outreach. One of the charge from, um, you know, from the city was basically, can you find innovative way of engaging the community? And so what we attempted to do was uh, different kind of media formats in terms of engagement. Um, you know, one was to direct email as what you saw. And if you find that we should reach out to other community members, please put it in the chat and we'll record it and reach out to them. Uh, we did kind of in-person uh, community outreach um, and we, attempted to do it in both Spanish. Actually, I, actually this was uh, suggested by Chevelle that there's a large population that speaks Spanish. Uh, and so we tried to do posters in Spanish to make sure that we engage the community members. Um, there, on, Jason, you can put on the chat, there's an online survey that you can also complete on, you know, it's about 10 to 15 minutes that ask you a series of questions about what would you really like to see here? And also there's the, the QR code that they can scan uh, that will take them directly to the survey as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jason. Also, yeah, there's an English survey and uh, the form and link is there in the chat. I think one of the things in terms of uh, having an opportunity to connect with the public and gain feedback, it was an opportunity for us to literally speak to the people who will be using or interacting with the space. And so to hear their feedback was so important for us. Uh, it was a, a cold, kind of wet day, but it, it still gave us, it was, we had an excellent turnout. So our in-person meeting, uh, as you can see here, myself, Hansi, and some other uh, family, uh, what we were able to do is we were able to not only uh, allow young people and their parents to give us feedback, they were able to select, select features, different components that they felt more connected to uh, in the space. It was really wonderful to see Marlon engage with residents that knew him when he was a child in the space.
is a brief survey and uh, we have some questions here um, that I, I will read to you just very briefly uh, that we used in the survey. And these questions actually received a lot of feedback. So um, we, we de decided to select out of that uh, large group, these, these primarily, uh, these questions in, um, um, to, to focus on. Number one, why do you visit the DeWitt playground? And so a question that came up, obviously A, to exercise for kids to play and to have lunch. Uh, number two is what is the role of public art? Very important, right? What is public art? How does it identify with the neighborhood? And so the question was neighborhood identity, social change, inspiration and creativity and economic development. Number three, what public art do you enjoy or would you wanna see in the playground? Uh, they talked about ideas around murals, interactive uh, forms or works, play spaces, murals of the founders of the MD, MPDC. Uh, number four, what are some additional ideas or concepts you might want addressed? And so uh, here is a list below. A, uh, one, art that represents history and teaching, a fitness, wellness, uh, and mental health, um, a place for people to sit. This is actually interesting. Uh, I think, you know, when you play sports, if you're, you know, active in sports, right? It's primarily basketball, right? Um, most people, it's usually an open space. And so one of the things that really came up fairly consistently was the idea not only of sitting, but having some kind of shade. Um, uh, number five, uh, children need to be represented. More uh, playground equipment for younger children to interact with. And then also pavers. How do we, you know, some, you know, parents uh, or residents talked about the idea of gentrification, right? And feeling that this space was changing, but they also wanted to see markers that represented the, 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 the I wouldn't say ancestors, but those who came before. So pavers that engraved residents' names uh, that were important to the neighbors too as well. Next. And then five, what black leaders of the past or present would you like to see represented? Um, and then, so there were a list of leaders and, and whether black, uh, you know, whether female or male, uh, there were a group of names that came up from Chuck Turner to Melina Cass to Harry Tugman um, that wanted to be embedded into the space. I know the DeWitt Center is a center in which, uh, you know, there's a facility there around education and, uh, and, the, and also play too as well. So I think that it borders on the idea of an interaction between not only the space, but its, its overall goal to uh, uplift the community. Hansi, is there anything you wanted to say? About no, I think you covered it. It was really nice to hear some of the residents saying that they enjoy seeing the elderly doing karaoke outside mm -hmm. and that if there's a way that we can make sure to have an amplifier. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you know, just kind of like expand on already activities that ex exist and occur and, and to provide that space for them to continue to do so. And so uh, the, the project scope, you, you can, uh, if you'd like, Hansi, you can oh, sure. talk about Definitely. some of the <laughs> cycle. Yeah. So I, I think Marlon would get into the vision for the project, but I think if, as an as architect and urban designer, um, we want to facilitate some of the community aspirations with um, some of the artist's vision, which is, you know, Marlon's ideas about, um, you know, how we can begin to activate the sidelines of the space. So what you see here is, um, you know, kind of interventions um, on the existing ready playground and court. So you ha we have here, you know, starting at the northern portion of the site, we have this idea of trail of history. So it was mentioned that the community members would like to see some forms of pavers with that marks certain significant places or people. Um, and then going down, we saw an opportunity to create, um, you know, sculptural play area for people to, or, or seating areas for, for different generation to commune, come together. And then as you go kind of the middle portion of the site, we see half the field, we have these beautiful kind of seating sculpture that are embedded in the landscape to provide kind of a seating auditorium to watch performances, you know, to occur. Then we have here um, this idea of 
two fence structures. One is going to be called the mirror of history, and that's existing already in the in the kind of six foot or eight foot tall fence that is kind of a partition between the court and the half court. So we had this idea of like, how do you make this fence beautiful? Like, and so you know, there's an idea of projecting some history on on that surface, uh, and then you have this the beautiful uh, you know on the sidelines beautiful. Um, drawings that you know is authored by Marlin uh, as a space of you know um, kind of in between like watching the game and you know within that within watching the game you have shaded canopies along the sidelines uh, and then on the right side or the lower right side you have additional place seating sculptures that works really great near the fitness space that exists on the site and we have this uh, also like linear kind of History, we call fence of history, which you'll begin to see visualizations of that, but that begins to put forward silhouettes of figures, important figures, but they're empty so that you can project your own body into them. And, and Marlon can speak more about that. Great. Excellent. Um, yeah, and so uh, obviously, well, what we have in front of you is our uh, the precedents or uh, some of the ideas uh, that we used as a reference. Um, and amazing space, you know, thinking about different ways of, of sitting, uh, interacting, um, undulating forms, um, play objects that uh, move through space differently and activate the body. And also, in one way, think about playing through education, Montessori process. And so uh, what we have here are some of the, is the sketches. And so these initial sketches of the fence structures that I did uh, of the, the place seating, seating sculptures, as well as embodying history in the sidelines. Um, also the mural of history, thinking about a climbing wall, right? What would that look like for young people to have an opportunity to climb history? Uh, and, and, and also the idea of that repetition as being a mimetic kind of process, right? Really embed in their own consciousness, the idea of history being something that they um, have the opportunity to shift and change. And here are the architectural renderings. You know, these I just can see these are just so beautifully uh, uh, illustrated. Um, and we can see like images of past residents of Melina Cass or Martin Luther King or, you know, all those kind of historical figures can be embedded uh, in the wall that students are, uh, or young people are, are playing and climbing on. In the lower right-hand corner, you see Exploring Sacred Geometry. Uh, this is one of my uh, large-scale installations that I did in 2016 at uh, Montserrat School of Arts. And, um, and we use that uh, as an inspiration for uh, the abstracted designs and forms embedded into the space. It's mirror history. And then we have the historical figures, once again, the silhouettes that Hansi mentioned as not only archetype, but right, uh, a way of presenting your body in reference to history and not literally embodying history by stepping into the silhouette of history. Powerful. And those are the fences on the far right um, that will uh, meander uh, uh, next to the, uh, or, or, or be positioned next to the, the walkway that takes us from one end to from the beginning to the very end of the of the play space. And then we have uh, the sidelines, rearticulated forms, geometry and, and geometric forms throughout space that reference, you know, that idea of African ritual, right? Really embedded, right, in the culture of basketball and sports is this idea of transformation, how uh, you know, the high five, which is purely African gesture, right? How that has been kind of uh, commodified and turned into what we know is a melting pot here in America. So those, the core geometry is also embedded in new form as a framing for this space on the sidelines. And then once again, the trill of history, a marker, uh, a passage of time, uh, all in some way a reflection on our transition from one space to the next. And these points function as beacons, but also as uh, locational points or nodes within the park 
um, that, that we can use as uh, access points for thinking, for experience, for learning. Um, Hansi, would you like to talk a little bit about the, the place seating sculptures? I think they're yeah. amazing. Yeah. Marlon, well, I think you've been doing an awesome job. And, you know, again, we want to, you know, facilitate this idea of, you know, functional uh, amenities for the community. And, you know, we think that um, we, you could never have too little seating, you know, seating for networking for socialization and on these kind of place seating sculpture that really works off your artwork. Uh, yeah. I think it's really important to contextualize, um, you know, to always put forward knowledge. And so it's really important that we were assessing the community so we can put forward the things that matter to the community and to, and, you know, by literally writing it, it, it doesn't disappear is, you know, is generational. Yeah. And one thing that, uh, you know, I think came up in the conversation that we talked about a little bit is the idea of Braille, right? For, for that history to be also translated into, for those who uh, are, do not have uh, the full access, right? To the visual. Uh, so they, they can read uh, using Braille, uh, the historical references and information and history. Next. Yeah, amazing, amazing forms, interactive play space, um, you know, very clean, stripped down, but also uh, so much about uh, the, the lines and the geometry found within the court re-articulated through the design. Marlon, also we had conversations about how when you're watching a ball game, mm -hmm. um, you know, what can the younger, gen younger members do Mm -hmm. while watch while other members are watching a game so it's really about activating the space through play and that's yeah. why our team is called play play that's right that's yeah. right and also i think uh with with this final seating we talk a little bit about the fact that not only was about play but it's about family and we started started thinking about uh incorporating or embedding um some uh, solo power, right? The idea of sustainability too, right? How can we, you know, um, create a space that's uh, green, right? But also, you know, we can embed some solar energy that, or, or some uh, device that allows people to charge their phones, but also be able to, you know, be there and be present. Ooh, it gets really hot on that court. You need some shaded canopy, <laughs> makes a difference, right? When you can sit in the breeze um, with friends and, and watch the game and maybe even read a book. You know, it's a space that can, is, is multifunctional. It doesn't always just have to be around play. It can be around learning. Uh, you know, youth groups, young people uh, from the Dewey Center can also go onto the courts and use the shaded canopy as a place of rest and, and reflection. And those two border both of the courts too as well. Uh, we have a summary of designs here that you can look at. One, the mirror history. Two, the fence of history. Three, the sidelines. Four, the trill of history. Five, play and seating, and uh, the play and seating two, uh, six, and then shaded canopies. Think of these images as not only an image, but almost uh, points for you to reflect on in an essay on writing. It's a visual narrative for you to be able to look at and understand the, the nuances of the space. Hansi, you, you can jump in the overall yeah. project design. Yeah, you can go yeah. on. So, you know, we've heard um, from Madison Park and from the residents, you know, asking what, what was the timeline for the project? And, you know, in general, we're going through the design process right now, you know, till June. Um, if everything goes smoothly, we're looking at construction documents, you know, the technical aspects of the project from June to September, and then fabrication from September, February. So we're li really looking at, you know, April of next year 
to realize all of the, the project. Um, I think the longest phase was the community process. We just want to make sure that we engage the community. Um, and it's, it's really important that there's feeling of ownership to the space. And so, you know, I, I also welcome members that are on this Zoom call to feel that they can, you know, contribute from what they've seen. You know, this is why we're holding this. Um, and the intention is to continue and inform the public through our process. Jason, can you go to the next slide? I think this is not to really go through, but just to show like the dark green dash lines is where we are in that whole process. And so we constantly are updating and going as, you know, as efficient as we can, you know, with, with COVID. <laughs> it's an amazing plan, amazing organization. Um, I wanna, once again, thank you, Sarah. Uh, I also wanna thank you, Hansi. Uh, it's been amazing working with you on the project. Uh, and so uh, my information here, Marlon Forrester, you can definitely check out my website, uh, www.marlonforrester.com as well as you can email me if you have questions at marlonforrester1 at gmail.com. And feel free to also email myself or Jason, who I believe is, is the emails on there on the city website, if you have any questions or concerns. Again, I also wanna thank the whole team here <laughs> and also the public who has a real invested interest in making this project happen. Thank you so much for this amazing opportunity. And Sarah, she also put her email contact for the city yes. as well. Yes. So we want to see you guys out there, guys. We want to yeah. see you out there. Come on out. So I mean, I think to wrap it up, our intention is is to you know hear thoughts from those that are here that represent the public, uh, and then in terms of next steps. What we would like to do is make this recording accessible on the city website and to also email it to all of our contacts, um, you know, in terms of outreach. Yeah. And we're going to do it again. I, I know this is not the first time. So I know that, uh, you know, this is an opportunity for us to engage with the community and create a opportunity for you to hear and get a better sense of what we're doing to kind of transform uh, public space for you. And Marlon and Hansi, there was a question from Abigail Forrester, if you're open to taking some questions at this point. Yes, um, he yes asked, for sure. I don't, I don't know if Abigail, if you want to unmute and ask directly, or I can read it, whatever you prefer. I don't know if he's still with us, so I will read it. Um, he said, he asked, how are you reaching out to a concentration of youth to influence the images? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's something that uh, I think is a great question. And I think what we're doing, I think, has been really reaching out to different community uh, centers and leaders. But I think, you know, one of the locations that has a lot of impact is the Yaki Boys and Girls Club, located in uh, just less than five minute walk away. Um, so I think what we'll, or what we hope to do is um, reach out to the Yaki and see if there's a possibility for us to keep even further this conversation of whether in a virtual space or a physical space with them in the future. I think Andrea Swain is a director there and she's absolutely phenomenal in terms of her work she's done with the community. Also to, um, to add, when we were on site, it was mentioned to Marlon and us to reach out to the, the people that play ball <laughs> and and I'm not sure if that's possible now um, but you know they were mentioning when there's a game why don't you go and just ask the people yeah. that are playing the ball yeah so that's on I mean, our to-do list and they talked about tournaments they talked about a lot you know so uh, <laughs> you I think know, the DeWitt uh, Center usually has a tournament in the summer yeah. they have in the past uh, before yeah. the renovation and obviously the, the, the park, the, the courts were renovated um, during COVID era. So I don't think they're, I think it didn't happen last year. Um, 
but it may be worth reaching out to them to see what their timeline is and what they're thinking for the summer. It's usually like July, August. I don't know how that dovetails into your schedule. Um, but I think, yeah, I think, you know, it's mostly pickup games. Hi, everybody. Can I speak? Yes, I was just going to say, Jeannie, please speak. And then I'll, I'll ask Catherine to ask her question. Welcome. Yeah, of course. Hi, hi. How's everybody doing? Um, yeah, so I'm the youth workforce manager for Madison Park Development Corporation. Um, I oversee uh, five youth programs. And as far as um, we we were the ones that kind of handled the leagues that used to happen at that court. So if you guys need in, uh, input from our young people, we have 55 young people yes. uh, that are engaged in the program right now. They're 14 yeah. to 21. Good. And they're all actually employed um, and, and we do workforce development, we do life skills, wellness. So if you guys need to do um, a focus group, I I'd be more than happy to have you guys come oh, into okay. our space. We meet ev almost every day except Tuesdays. I would so, love that. Um, G, can you give us your email in the chat? And we'll yeah, I tried, I tried to put it to everybody and it's just only directing it to one person. Oh, no. So, yeah, okay. it's, I've, I think I've it's only going it to Sarah Ro Ro Rodrigo. That's me. <laughs> okay. I'm with the mayor's office of arts and culture. So I'm not sure why the chat is set that way, but I have your, um, I have your email address. I've noted it down and we are saving the chat as well. Great. Yeah, and definitely. And our, our, our summer program, we're still taking applications. We've received um, uh, close to 140 applications already for 60 positions. But if you guys want um, to do like an orientation, um, you know, we have, we always, I'm sorry, we always have orientations for our summer program. And if you guys just want to run a quick survey or just show a, a quick PowerPoint to get, to gauge what young people want, that's what I love to do. I love to survey young people before I do anything. Um, so yeah, if, if it's, if it's, if you guys want it, my contact, Sarah has it. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Jeannie. Yeah. I, I can't wait and, and Ab used to be my boss. Uh, Ab, Ab, Ab used to be your boss? <laughs> yeah, Ab, he's, he's like my, he's like my, my professional mentor. I love him. So, okay. um, yeah, I'm still there. I'm still at, at MPDC. <laughs> okay, excellent, excellent, excellent. So I, I think we're going to have some great conversations. And let me know if you guys need interns. Um, you know, we, we, we pay them free of charge for you guys. Uh, if oh. anybody needs interns, um, we're going to be hiring a lot. And they, they come well prepared. They go through a very rigorous um, workforce development uh, training before they're actually placed. They have to prove that they... Um, that they can be in an internship site. So if you guys want, I'm going to be placing young people uh, July 6th through August 20th. You guys can have free labor. <laughs> so let Excellent. me know. Yeah, All that's right. amazing because we'll need some fabrication help. Hey. Yeah, so, and I'm, you, know, I'm always, you know, I'm always hey. looking for, I'm always looking for dynamic places where young people can build hey. a career path from there. So I would love to speak to everyone in this group. Um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to make connections. I'm definitely interested in the DeWitt playground because obviously my young people are always there, are gonna be there. Um, well, but that's well, what interested well, me about tonight. Jeannie, you know, also uh, I didn't mention this, but I, I teach, I, I've been teaching in Boston public schools for over, I would say over 10 years now. Um, so I, I do have some students like Habab, uh, okay. a couple of guys who uh, use and frequent the uh, DeWitt playground. Oh, um, no so, kidding. You know, I run into a lot of my students, so it would be great to, you know, definitely connect with you and, and, and really, you know, I do have some projects in mind, so there's, there's work to be done. Okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plug something else. If any of you guys, especially you, uh, Mr. Forrester, um, you know, I am looking for instructors for the summer to do dynamic programming because um, we're oh. building our program. Uh, the way that I'm designing it this year is called CPX, Career Path Exchange. And okay. it's really to um, kind of, I, I'm, I hope I'm not taking over the meeting. Am I taking over the meeting? You That's can. Fine. Okay. Um, so, so basically it's, it's broken up into five paths. Um, so one is called uh, Creative Industry Academy. That's for, you know, creative industries. FI is called, is for financial independence, um, health careers, exploration, um, next generation uh, careers and um, pre-trade, which is construction. So I'm looking for instructors to teach within those career paths. Mm -hmm. So if you want to come for six hours a week, teach our young people, that would be great. Thank you. I'll stop. Thank you so much, Jenny. And we'll make sure to do like a focus group with your youth. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Anytime, anytime. I just, um, my, my academic program uh, ends June 1st, just, yeah. just FYI. And then we start back up July 7th. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. We'll do it before June 1st because we want to move the project forward. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Hit me up. Hit me up. I'm free. Thank you. 
Thank, Thank you. you, Timmy. That was awesome. I just wanted to say Catherine also chatted before the chat was set properly and she had a question. I don't know, Catherine, if you want to unmute and ask or if you'd like me to read your comment and your question, um, I'll sure. give you a second. Oh, hi. Hi. Thank you so much for um, this great presentation. Uh, my question is about the fence of history. Um, so since I saw in your presentation, it's about past and present figures. Um, so has there been any thoughts about flexibility on the types of figures in this fence? And if people in the community would be able to add on after the project is completed and I guess how to future proof um, the project? Uh, I, I think uh, just real quickly from my perspective, you know, um, I, you know, this project is really about a very open uh, perspective. And so um, as an artist, I have some ideas, but I'm not wed to them, uh, especially with the, the, you know, that's idea of history, right? We all are part of, you know, understanding each other, but also we all bring different stories and narratives to the table and historical figures too as well. So I, I, I would definitely see that we're open to, you know, you sharing some of those ideas of, of what historical figures um, are important to you um, to be visible. Hansi? Jason, can you add, can you put the online survey again? Uh, so if Catherine has an opportunity and you need to fulfill it, that would be great. Catherine, just to, you know, from an architect's point of view, what I'm hearing is this idea of um, a design, but that there's flexibility. And so, you know, I can talk to Marlon about, you know, how, how can these panels potentially change? Or again, how can we partner with local organizations, with youth group, um, with residents to, you know, to make those changes, you know, within an existing kind of built structure. So th that's a great feedback for us to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It would be great to know, Catherine, um, what what brought you here. Oh, I'm actually an artist and an architect, and I'm just interested in um, public art in general and the city of Boston. So I just was interested in your presentation. So thank you so much. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for coming, Catherine. Are there any other questions or comments anyone wants to share? I see Christina, Christina, <laughs> Christina. <laughs> Come Hi, on, Marlon. Christina. How are you, Christina? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I think we've been IG friends. <laughs> yes. IG um, friends. I didn't have any questions. Um, I uh, knew, well, I saw on social media that you were holding this and before um, when you had the presentation with the Cooper, um, I was a little bit more interested in learning about like how art overlaps with uh, more architecture and public art since um, I have been considering um, possibly going into architecture school for my graduate um, mm -hmm. career. So I think that your presentation was kind of like a good bridge for me to like start understanding how um, art flows into architecture as well as public art. Um, and so I've just been independently studying that. So that's why I was interested in being here today. Good, good. And, and do you see anything um, in terms of, you know, cause I, I think those two worlds exist simultaneously together but they never really have a lot of conversations with each other, right? Um, from this, the, the perspective of designers, you know, there's a, a kind of, at least from my experience, there are specific systematic ways of looking around projects and, and, art, and artists who are like, you know, from the painting and drawing side, you know, there's kind of this sense of an infinity, you know, like artists are just, you know, creating work infinitely, right? Just keeps on going and there isn't really uh, an end to it, right? And so how do you how do you see, you know, the, the foundation or traditional approaches in art 
and then that that of you know architecture and design melding together in this work. And that's a, just a question. I'm being a teacher right now, right? And um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to hold you accountable, right? You you stepped in and you you opened the window, and and now it's my my turn to kind of ask you a little bit more. Tell me more. Um. Well, at least for me, I think that um, one of like the interesting parts of the presentation was like, like the different forms of accessibility that you guys are introducing into the space. Mm -hmm. um, I have realized in some instances in the past um, that um, this is like one specific example that a building um, that was on the Harvard campus property um, had braille only for it being physically I, like visual but you when you touched it it wasn't braille so it was completely inaccessible to what it was supposed to be and um, unfortunately to me just made it seem like it was just a visual show for that being there whereas you guys are directly incorporating it into the park in the way so that it's like a tactile element that is educational for um, the um, the different historical people you want to highlight in uh, the design and incorporation of it. Um, so to me, I've been really like focusing a lot on like accessibility and thinking of things how um, either sometimes things may seem accessible and they truly aren't, whereas there's other forms where of um, design uh, both uh, internal structures like for homes and apartment buildings um, or outside structures for playgrounds um, that uh, I've seen more like unique forms of accessibility that I feel like have been forgotten a lot of the time. Um, I know um, a big reason why I started learning sign language because I knew that that was a way that uh, me being a communication student was a way for me to be more accessible in my communications. Um, and I think also now like learning about like architectural design helps me think of how um, even if something's like a small interactive um, like art exhibit, how that can be accessible to different peoples and different abilities. Thank you for sharing, Christina. Thank you. Wow. Yeah, Christina, I, um, I recommend for you to look at Judith Baca's work. Can you spell that for me, please? Her last name. Baca is B A C A. B A C A. Um, you know, Mexican descendant artist that did the Great Wall in LA. Um, but accessibility was a big one. And in terms of the discipline, she said that she had to unlearn a lot of the things. That she learned in, edu in, in ac academia and it was it hit her when she brought her father to the great wall and that he was able to access it uh, have access to the history and the information but um take a take a look at her work seems like uh that would that's a good example of the line between art and and architecture um yeah judith bucca thank you <laughs> I will. <laughs> Christina, I just add a link to the chat if you want to grab it. Thank you. This was great. Yeah, thank you all. This is a, a wonderful conversation. Um, yeah. We are at time. Does anyone have any, any final thoughts? Christina made me think a lot from the auditorial perspective, like when we had meetings with an elderly population, it was through a phone call because Zoom did not work. And so we were just listening. It was Marlon, you know, like listening to the conversations and, and, and myself as well. And so this idea of oral history, um, being able to talk to, to record, to play back, it's important, different forms of accessibility and media. And, and you know what, Hansi, you know, that also triggered something in my mind that said that, oh, 
you know, I mean, we only have so much money, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, now we're going to hang out with Jimmy's. Uh, we need some more uh, money. <laughs> Come on, let's keep going. Now I'm like, sound spaces for history and learning. Uh, oh my goodness. Then light spaces for projection. That's going to replace your climbing wall because we have to make sure no one gets hurt. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Good. Okay. This is good. All right. This is amazing. So so thank you, Sarah, again. It's it's excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Hansi. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for everyone. Great to see you, Christina. All right. I'm keeping my eyes on my 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 IG fan friends. You know, I'm looking out there for you. I know you are. Okay. <laughs> Mylan, Hansi, Chase, thank you all. Thank you, Kathy, thank you. for being here and for, for everyone. This is such a great conversation. Excellent. Thanks for setting Thank us up. All right, everybody, have Thank a you. great night. You too. You too.